Welcome everyone to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Um, so I have a few announcements. Uh, first, some scheduling announcements. Next week, we are not having a board meeting. Um, it is canceled. And then the, the next week, which is the 29th of May, we are traveling down to Randolph, Vermont, and having a traveling board meeting at Gifford Hospital. If there's any questions on that, that all of the information is on our website. Um, I do have um, two announcements about uh, rate filings. The first is regarding the Cigna rate decision that the board recently made. Uh, so on February 7, 2019, Cigna Health and Life Insurance Company proposed an average annual rate decrease of minus 3.6% for its large employer groups, affecting 534 Vermont members. On February 22nd, Cigna corrected an er error in its filing, which changed the proposed average annual rate from a decrease of minus 3.6% to an increase of 0.2%. On May 9th, the Green, Green Mountain Care Board ordered Cigna to reduce its profit margin from 3.5% to 1.0% and approved the modified rate, resulting in an overall average annual rate decrease of approximately minus 2.4%. Regarding the Vermont Health Connect 2020 filing rates, on May 10th, 2019, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont, an MVP, filed proposed rates for plans that will be offered on Vermont Health Connect for 2020. Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont proposes an average annual increase of 15.6% over 2019 premiums, with proposed increases per plan ranging from 9.1% to 18.5%. MVP proposes an average annual increase of 9.4% over 2019 premiums, with proposed increases per plan ranging from 5% to 23.7%. The hearing dates for these rate requests are July 22nd for MVP and July 23rd for Blue Cross Blue Shield. The board will also hold a public comment forum on the afternoon of July 23rd, beginning at 4.30 p.m. Those hearings, I believe this year, start at 8 a.m., but I would double check the website on that. I, I'm, I'm fairly positive, um, starting at 8 a.m. And um, the anticipated decision date for the filings is August 8th. And I would encourage folks who have questions about these rate filings to visit our website under uh, the rate review page. I believe that is all I have to announce. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next item are the <laughs> minutes of Wednesday, April 24th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, April 24th okay. without any deletions, additions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? One abstention. And one abstention due to absenteeism. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> Guess I'll never be absent. <laughs> With that, we'll invite uh, Mike and the team out <coughs> front. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is uh, Mike Smith. I'm the president and CEO, uh, the interim president and CEO of Vital. Um, I'll let the rest of the team here introduce themselves, starting with Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Delabriere, Director of Client Services. I'm Bob Cherneau, uh, Chief Financial Officer for Vital. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Frank Harris, the Strategic Technology Advisor for Vital. And in the audience, and I'll just ask them to raise their hands, we have uh, Christopher Shank, who's the Director of Technology, and Carolyn Stone, who's the Director of Operations. I brought the whole team here to get a sense of uh, the process uh, for the Green Mountain Care Board, especially in the budget process as we move <coughs> forward. I just wanted to do a short intro before we unleash Bob on the numbers, uh, and um, he can go from, from there. Uh, one of the things that, if you've heard me lately in the legislature, um, that, um, that I have said as I've been testifying is what a difference a year makes. I mean, um, in FY19, we established a strategic plan and revised our mission statement. We updated our bylaws. We strengthened board membership criteria. We added new board members, including Dartmouth, as a, a board member. We developed new ways to make it easier for providers to access and view the VHI information. We continue a data quality improvements. We establish connectivity criteria. We advocated, advocated changing uh, Vermont's consent policy, and I think we've been fairly successful in that area. Uh, the, the challenge is going to be now implementing that policy in a way that meets the criteria of the legislation. And we implemented a technology roadmap. Now, we did all these things, and we sort of established, as you remember, last year a three-year fiscal plan because we think, we believe we had to accomplish three objectives um, as we look forward into 21. This budget's on 20, but as we look forward to 21, we believe we had to accomplish three major fundamental objectives. That was to stabilize operations. Um, the second was to reestablish credibility. And the third was to put in, tool, put in place tools that allow us to add value-added products along the way. We think we have done that. And the reason we had to do that step approach, um, we believe it was imperative that we stabilize our operations, reestablish credibility, and add value-added uh, tools first, uh, because one of our major objectives in this budget, although you won't see the concrete examples of it, but we're moving towards that with the tools, is to diversify our revenue stream in FY21. Uh, we also had budgeted objectives of uh, improve data quality, reach out to clients, make smart technology choices, evaluate our ex existing infrastructure, and we'll go all through this, maintain a high level of focus on system security, and maintain a workforce. We, we have to start in this, in this budget cycle, um, diversify our revenue base. And although, you do, like I said, you don't see it in the res results of this budget, we are laying the foundation for that in the, this budget. An example is what I would call the collaborative services or the shared services um, that we are uh, proposing in this budget. Here's what we told you a year ago. Here's where we are now in comparison to what we told you. Last year, we established a three-year <laughs> budget plan uh, in, fiscal, in fiscal 19. We said we would end the year uh, with a balanced budget through reductions. Actually, we said we hope to end with a surplus. Um, that surplus uh, will be about 600000 for FY19. In FY20 last year, we said we're going to take that surplus and use it to offset an operating deficit and, uh, and have a balanced budget using the – have an operating def deficit and use that surplus to offset that operating deficit. Um, even though we've seen continued uh, reductions in state funding, um, and, and we anticipate that we'll have an operating deficit in FY20 of about 186000 to be covered by cash in on hand. As you noticed, since FY18, we have been building cash in anticipation of uh, FY20. And FY21, we had said last year that we anticipate balancing this budget through providing value-added products to the state government and Vermont providers, and we are in that process right now of looking at ways to develop new revenue streams for uh, FY21. Just wanted to sort of set the stage in terms of where we were, where we are, and where we're going before I hand it over to Bob, and I'll hand it over to Bob. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to go through some charts 
that are relevant to our FY20 budget request. But before I start, I'd really like to thank Agatha Kessler and Sarah Kinsler from the Green Mountain Care Board uh, for their help and guidance in getting us to this point. Before we move on to this year's budget, I'd like to recap FY19. Um, FY19 ends June 30th. Um, our expectations are that our revenue will be on budget, but our expenses will be 10% under budget. Um, this is driven by lower personnel costs due to some vacancies and administration in the technology teams. We had originally budgeted for FY19 23.6 full-time equivalents, yet this year we have run around 21.8 full-time equivalents on average for the year. Also, our technology spend is lower as we have paused or delayed the implementation of several technology projects for our review and the potential incorporation into the collaborative services projects which Mike just spoke about. Finally, um, evidence of our well um, being is that our cash on hand for FY19 is projected to be $2.2 million at the end of the year or 150 days, which is considerably more than uh, in our previous years. Moving on. Our budget assumptions have been shaped by many factors. Uh, the budget was developed from a review and assessment of vitals cost at its lowest possible level by person and by vendor. Comparing what we've spent for FY19 in prior years with what we anticipate those expenses will be in FY20. The following are budget assumptions which Vital sees as the most significant. First and foremost is that we need to complete our current contract requirements. The next would be the award of follow on contracts from DIVA and OCV. And this will only happen if we're successful in meeting our contractual requirements. As Mike mentioned, we need to maintain our critical talent. And finally, we need to continue to identify and pursue cost reductions and opportunities. Moving on to revenue. In FY19, we transitioned from contracts awarded on a state fiscal year basis to being awarded on January 1st. So therefore, follow-on contracts will be a full year in length, but spanning a half of FY20 and one half of FY21. So therefore, one half of the year will be a firm number based on the left to go portion of that awarded value of the contract. Well, the other half will be an estimate. And as I will describe, um, this in a future uh, slide, um, management believes that management is confident that we will be able to, to make these um, projections. Finally, we've shown FY21 to illustrate our anticipation that the revenue for the state in FY21 will be stable. This chart shows the decline in state funding since FY21. These values are contract values. Since FY17, there's been an overall reduction in vitals funding of about $1.3 million, or 22%. And as vital state funding has declined, we have taken cost out of the business to uh, remain sustainable. I just, I just want to point out um, an observation here. As I was thinking about this slide, I don't believe uh, anyone in healthcare that I've seen so far has essentially lowered their revenue and their cost and been su as successful as Vital has been in lowering that almost 22 percent. Um, uh, this is a phenomenal uh, job that, quite frankly, these people did in making sure and enhanced operations at the same time. I, I'm pretty proud of the, the staff at Vital for what they did. Thank you, Mike. Focusing on FY20 revenue, um, 
the CY19 DIVA contract is shown in green, and it is based in, on the left-to-go portion of the awarded contract. So this is our CY19 contract from July through December 2019. The other half of this is a projection for CY20 for January 2020 through June 2020. Again, VITAL believes um, that it will be successful in a final contract with DIVA that is at least equal to this estimate. One takeaway from this chart is that over half of our revenue is based on firm awarded contracts. Mike. This is back to me because I am excited about this project. To me, this is an important sort of blueprint uh, for our project because fundamentally, it seeks ways um, in healthcare to collaborate and lower cost and avoid uh, duplication. This is an effort uh, that attempts to do just that um, if successful. In Jan Let me just give you a little bit of background on this. In January, through the initiative of DIVA and with the support of VITAL and others, uh, we decided that instead of all of us whether it's one care, whether it's the blueprint, all of us buying essentially the same software three times, let's figure out a way of collaborating to only buy it once and let's share uh, some of this software. Some of this software is pretty expensive, uh, as, you, as you can see in the budget process. I think we're near $700,000 in total expenses on this. So we looked at ways in order to collaborate in order to buy this once, and in many cases, a Vital is taking the lead. These four uh, essential items are, one, having a common master patient index, um, Two is having a common terminology services so that we all are on the same page. And three is having a hub where we can bring in more information into uh, the VHI. And then lastly, and this is, this is quite important, is an interface hub that the utilities of this interface hub is used by most major sort of healthcare operations, and it gives us the ability to deliver information, to guarantee the delivery of information where we want it to go. We can point it to just about where we want to go. I am very excited about this project. I think it, it, show, it shows a map of wh what we can do in Vermont if we sort of all get in the same room and, uh, and put our heads together. And, uh, you know, I, I would like, matter of fact, I'm kind of insisting, as they will know, I would like to see this in place, up and running, before I leave uh, a Vital, and uh, we're pushing towards that right now. Thanks, Mike. Moving on to expenses, labor costs for Vital are our largest expense item, and this year, um, our budget assumes 22.6 full-time equivalents. Again, for comparison, F the FY19 budget was 23.6, and our current forecast is 21.8. Our expenses for material and services represent an overall increase, and this is driven by the addition of the collaborative services projects. If you take these projects out and compare them to the FY19 forecast, it's about the same. So meaning that our budget um, for material and services for FY20 is essentially flat. Focusing more on expenses, Again, labor is our largest expense at 2.9 million, or 47% of our total spend. The next largest component is VHI hosting. In previous years, I've identified this as medicity. Um, however, back in July of 2018, they were acquired by Health Catalyst. Um, they represent 17% of our expenses. Technology is next, and it comprises 13% of our expenses. 
and contains data security, network services, along with software licenses and services. We have also included in this budget additional projects to enhance security um, of the VHI. Finally, um, I have a catch-all basin here called All Other. This contains occupancy, consulting, insurance, supplies, etc. It should be noted that in FY19, Vital was successful in reducing our footprint at our office from 11,000 square feet to 7,000 square feet and reducing our rent to the projections that we used within the FY19 budget. Finally, we should note that as we add additional functionality to the VHI, whether security related or operational, our cost, vitals cost will go up over time. Since FY17, Vitals organization has been flattened to streamline reporting, promote coordination between employees, and reduce cost. For example, directors now report directly to the CEO instead of other executive positions. Given the size of Vital and the additional level of management, well, excuse me, given the size of Vital and an additional level of management is not needed. We have also changed some personnel responsibility to focus more on business processes and organizational efficiencies. So while Vital is a lean organization, one deep in some skills, we are still capable of meeting our contractual requirements. I just want to add here, if you look at FY17, um, there were two layers of management um, that are not in the current uh, uh, FY20 and perhaps the last half of FY19 sort of organizational chart. We basically took out the C-suite um, uh, positions out of the organization and we also have taken out the vice president sort of roles in that organization as well. So you see two levels that are virtually gone. I think it's important with the size of our organization, we need to be quick, we need to be nimble, we need to be responsive to our clients and to the market that's out there. And I think this allows that to happen. So in terms of headcount, um, this year, um, we have not included, a, as Mike has pointed out, the other COO position, um, which would have been in our FY19 budget. In addition, while we do have some open positions to bring us up to our forecasted full-time equivalent uh, projection for FY19, this budget does not include any new positions. In more detail, our salaries and wages assume a 3% inflation. In addition, there is no bonus program. Um, and we have also assumed that um, we will have the same benefits providers as we currently have. We have incorporated for inflation for those benefits a 6% inflation. Now, we have seen that the, there is a potential for about a 9.4% increase to health insurance, but that only adds about four to five thousand dollars worth of cost to our budget. Um, all other benefits, we have assumed a three percent increase. Moving on to um, what was formerly known as Medicity, which was acquired by Health Catalyst. Um, we have actually seen a more positive approach by Health Catalyst since the acquisition to, with our relationship. Um, they have gone to great lengths to help us um, in a number of uh, resolving a number of issues. Um, we expect to um, conclude negotiations with them on a six-month extension, and our estimate for their cost is unchanged from this year. Their charges, for the most part, except for the interface connectivity charges, which are 
more of a um, project-oriented charge are very um, stable. They are monthly periodic charges. Finally, moving on to uh, the balance sheet, VITAL has a very simple balance sheet. The largest portion of our assets is cash and accounts receivable. With cash, we project that we will continue to build it through the end of FY19. Then we will consume a small portion of that cash in FY20 <laughs> to cover our operating deficit of 186000 By the end of FY20, we project that we'll have about 117 days of cash on hand. Our projection for the balance sheet also includes two months' worth of accounts receivable um, with our customer, uh, the state of Vermont. And this is due simply to the cash conversion process, which takes about 50 to 55 days. The last piece of our asset um, base is our property plan and equipment. And this, while minimal, represents leasehold improvements and computer equipment at our Chase Mill office. By the end of FY20, Vital's balance sheet will remain strong. Concluding, Vital has minimal liabilities. We have accounts payable represented by the blue band above. We have, um, in some years, we have had a um, liability to the state involving the resolution of the FY17 grant final billing, which was extinguished uh, last year. And finally, we have accrued expenses, which are in the orange band. Um, if you take those um, and you calculate a quick or an acid test ratio, you come up for FY20 with about eight times, which um, is a very healthy measure of how liquid and how um, strong financially Vital has become over the years. So concluding my uh, presentations, I'll take any questions if there are. If, if it's okay with the board, I'd like to, because the technology section falls, Mr. Chair, the check technology achievements and plans falls directly into the budget aspect. Would you mind if we just kept going or Go do ahead. you want? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm even going to uh, talk about some of our technology achievements and plans. Um, and uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> first thing to point out is that our, our focus remains, um, you know, as I've talked about before, that the technology plans support the plans for the VHI generally. And our focus is on the most important areas that we're focusing on for improvement of the VHI around data quality, data availability and ease of use patient matching, patient consent, and data security and privacy. Um, the, as we've uh, talked about, we have a new initiative since I spoke to you last year and since we set our technology uh, strategy last year, and that's uh, around the collaborative or shared services. And uh, even though it's a new initiative since last year, it really is targeted directly at the priorities that we envisioned last year, which is around improved patient matching, improved terminology services, and improved interfacing capabilities, as Mike and Bob have spoken about. And uh, with the other participants in the effort, uh, we conducted due diligence around the potential technology solutions for this, and we vetted the technology alternatives, and we're now preparing to move forward, as Mike has described. And this implementation will undoubtedly be a major priority and focus in the technology uh, team of in the coming year. Next slide. Um, and uh, as we talked about last year, uh, reviewing our approach to improve um, the way we provide analysis data, we actually sort of expanded our focus on this, as I've spoken about before, um, where we wanted to look at our entire uh, architecture and technical platform. And we've uh, conducted a, a request for information to look at the uh, what we're calling future platform. Uh, we uh, considered 35 companies uh, in the market and wound up 
uh, at 14 companies that we sent the RFI to and had responses from 10 of those. We temporarily slowed that to focus on the shared services initiative, um, but we are uh, picking back up on that now and conducting the analysis of our RFI responses to determine the feasibility of changing platforms. And in this first phase, we're really trying to look at the feasibility. What would it cost? What would the opportunity cost be? Uh, because as we focus on replacing the platform and if uh, the outcome is feasible and certainly we'll be discussing that with um, uh, with the folks at DIVA and, and other uh, stakeholders um, we'll conduct an RFP process that will have uh, stakeholder engagement in making a decision about that uh, we're going to continue to advance our infrastructure approach and as I've spoken about before I see this as um, minimizing the overhead costs um, and first thing is that uh, you, to create a project plan to establish HDM, uh, the, the data warehouse side of our architecture, uh, disaster recovery capability for that. And we collaborated with the folks at DIVA and uh, the Agency of Digital Services on the plan. Uh, and we were beginning the first phase of that, which is known as a business impact analysis. And what that does is it inventories all the, the business processes that we need to support to operate the VHI and the system, and it ties out the systems that support them and basically establishes the criticality of those in the disaster recovery requirements. And once we go beyond that phase, we start to make some investments in the technology to support the disaster recovery. So we're looking to have an outcome on the future platform to see if we're going to continue with this platform before we make that investment. We're also looking to streamline the infrastructure, and we've uh, uh, had some good progress there. Uh, we decommissioned our infrastructure that was at Rackspace in Chicago, and there were some pretty significant operational savings from that. We established a support resource partnership so that we can uh, better manage the infrastructure and also uh, to position us to be able to better advance the infrastructure uh, so we have a flexible resource that we can call upon and more depth on the bench, so to speak. And then with the shared services initiative, we'll start to move away from the owned infrastructure, as I've spoken about before, and we'll be moving Rhapsody out of our owned infrastructure. In the area of data quality, there's been some, uh, I think, very significant achievements. Um, as, as the board knows, um, we established a new connectivity criteria, and I know the board approved that criteria. Uh, we're working with healthcare organizations now to evaluate their status against the criteria and to establish work plans for advancement through the criteria tiers. We also completed a project around uh, terminology services to standardize the top eight lab tests uh, that we receive in the data across 30 healthcare organizations as the data is, 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 the data is received. And with that, that experience will serve us well as we move into the shared services initiative and adopt a new terminology services technology and advance our capability further there. And we've drafted a data governance model for the shared services effort. And uh, there'll be a lot of data governance questions that will come up as that proceeds. Uh, and the error patient matching, as we've spoken about, that's another element of the shared services effort. And we conducted an RFI and involved the, the participants in a request for a proposal uh, for the MPI technology. And we selected a vendor pending successful contracting. They're known as Verado. Uh, we reduced duplicates in the current database, um, and we will implement a new master patient index as part of the shared services initiative. In the area of data availability and ease of use, I think there's been some exciting developments in this area. We have now integrated with the UVM Medical Center electronic health record, and providers can now query the VHI directly from within their electronic health record, which lowers the barrier to them accessing the data and, and being able to use that. And we added that. We've been doing that with the Veterans Administration, and so now this is our second site using that technology. We implemented two single sign-on sites for vital access, so that so if they if uh, they're not integrated directly into their electronic health record, we can make it easier for them to get to the portal uh, that that we provide the data in, and we'll continue to expand the sites that that uh, use these technologies. 
In the area of patient consent, uh, we now have three consent interfaces live, and we expect to hit the year-end calendar, uh, calendar year 19 target of 42 percent uh, consent um, by June 30th, so hit that, uh, that mark early. And we're currently engaged with all Vermont hospitals to expand those interfaces where the, where the organization has the technical capability to implement that. In the area of security, we, we, we're constantly focused on this, and I think it's pr probably the most important thing that we focus on in the technology program. We continued our robust program of regular audit by our industry expert consultants, uh, and we continue to improve our results year over year. We established a formal governance group with DIVA and ADS that we're calling the V-High Security Governance Group, and that group meets monthly and does a comprehensive review of our status in regard to security and our plans and in our progress against those plans. We established a cybersecurity framework. We use the, the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, cybersecurity framework, which is, provides a better structure to operate the program. And we're currently working on a master system security plan, which establishes security uh, standards for every individual system within Vital and how we operate those. Uh, and we're, we're about to release a request for proposal for a security monitoring system, which is known as a SIM, a security information event management system. And so now we'll pass to Andrea. Thank you. Wanted to provide some updates for you, and many of these Frank touched on already, but in the area of meaningful use and security risk as assessment consultations, Vital offers a service to healthcare providers across the state of Vermont, and there is, the intent is to improve data quality to help them meet measures that are set by the government to um, a test for meaningful use or effective use of their electronic health records. There's a pretty significant focus on data quality in this area. It's a, trem a tremendous time commitment, so there are high numbers of hours and low numbers of organizations because it's a tremendous lift. But we're really proud of this effort. We um, have, in the area of data quality in particular, it is working with organizations to, sit, to establish are they capturing accurate data from their patients? Are they capturing it in the appropriate area of their electronic health record? And how do they navigate the system to then attest and achieve meaningful use? In March, there were, our goal, by the way, is 80 hours per month for the calendar year 2019. And in March, we had 103.5 hour, hours, so pretty significant. The percent of Vermont patients providing consent. This is an area Frank also touched on. The red line is the target, which is 42% for calendar year 2019. We are currently, for the patients that have been asked, 40.86% of them have provided consent. We are on target to hit that 42% rate in June, by end of June. Connectivity, the work plans are a component of the connectivity criteria, which Frank touched on earlier. These are in progress. Our target for the year is 89, and the again, it's the goal is to help organizations achieve the next tier. So it's, are they capturing accurate information? Are they missing data elements? And if so, how can we make sure they're in the messages and then are the, transmitted to the VHI. If a healthcare organization is contributing electronically to the VHI, they are considered meeting tier one at this time and we're still evaluating tier two and eventually tier three. So point of care utilization, put another way, this is our providers, do providers need information and are they accessing the VHI to help make their healthcare decisions for their patients? And 
we continue to try to make this easier for healthcare organizations to implement, and we feel like we are making significant progress in this area. We have three ways to access the VHI, which Frank also mentioned. In March, there were 3,086 vital access queries. That's the web-based portal. Cross-community access, which is currently Veterans Affairs Administration and newly implemented University of Vermont Medical Center, were 236 queries in March. And single sign-on we have implemented at Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital and the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, and those were 193 queries. Another area where we provide uh, another value-added service for, for healthcare providers to receive the information they need is called provider results delivery. If, um, I'd like to give you an example, in because this sometimes is a bit confusing to people, but if I use myself an ex as an example, I have, I love cheese. So at some point in time, I may be in a position where I need to go find out if that cheese is affecting my cholesterol level. So I may go to Central Vermont Medical Center, for example, and have a lab test done. That lab test, would then be delivered, and this is this is a real example um, of the communication we have with these organizations. The lab result would be delivered seamlessly into my primary care provider's electronic health record at the health center in Plainfield, and they may not know it. So in the month of March, over 135,000 messages, and it's not just lab results, it's laboratory results, radiology reports, transcribed reports, are delivered into provider electronic health records. And in fact, there are 530 providers receiving those results. That's just for one month. I do want to emphasize this. This is something that I was astonished with about when I first came to Vital that we weren't talking about. That, you know, over a course of a year, we deliver about 1.4 million uh, lab results, radiology reports, and transcribed notes reports. This is important. Um, it's important to the day-to-day -day operations of uh, providers out there to know what labs, getting the labs to the right place at the right time. And often, as Andrea had said, the provider doesn't know. It just happens automatically within their EHR or their database, and, and they're oblivious to where this is coming, but it runs through Vital, which, which I asked Andrea to sort of pump it a little bit. She did, um, because it is something that I think we need to be a, a little bit proud of, of what we do and how we do it. And when you're not noticed, I think that's a good thing. Um, it's only when you're noticed that uh, that sometimes you run into problems on, on these sort of things. Mr. Chair, that's our presentation. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, entertain any sort of questions that you have on VITAL and, and our future. Thank you, Mike. Questions from the board? Jess? Okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, a couple quick ones. On the VHI hosting with Medicity, the contract with Health Catalyst, um, I was wondering when the contract expires and why only a six-month extension? The uh, the contract expires June 30th. We've asked for a six-month extension because I want to see what the results are on the future platform uh, to see what is what is happening and maybe possibly another six-month extension. But I didn't want to bring it out over multiple years until I could see what was happening with the future uh, platform analysis. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, the second one was around the patient consent and the, um, I guess this is slide 29, uh, the current engagement with the Vermont hospitals to expand interfaces where possible. I'm wondering the where possible of, of the Vermont hospitals that you have interacted with, where is it possible, where is it not possible, why is it not possible? <laughs> sure. Um, well, as, as we indicated, live electronic patient consent is with the University of Vermont Medical Center, Southwest of Vermont Medical Center, and Northeastern Vermont uh, Regional Hospital. A l electronic uh, patient consent project in process is with Northwest Medical Center, and I think that's going to come online pretty, pretty darn soon here. Um, electronic patient consent projects in progress after each 
EHR upgrades because there's a lot of, well, you know this, there's a lot of EHR upgrades going on out there right now. Uh, North Country Hospital, UVM Health Network, uh, Central Vermont Medical Center, uh, UVM Health Network, Porter. Those are going to happen in the fall, I think, is what, what my anticipation is on this. And still investigating is Copley Hospital and Gifford Medical Center. Electronic patient consent projects on hold, uh, Springfield Hospital and Rutland Regional because they've got some competing priorities down there. And EHRs that are not capable of electronic uh, patient consent are Brattleboro, Mount Escutney, and Grace Cottage at this time. Okay. Interesting. Very helpful and interesting. Thank you. Um, can, I, can you just tell me what those competing priorities are? I, I'm not sure I know. I don't know what the specifics are, um, but I tried a couple of times, and they were very, very friendly, but they just said we, we are not able to do this possibly in the fall is what they shared, but that was not concrete. Okay. Um, okay. And then my last question actually is on this slide. Uh, the number of providers receiving results in March 2019, 530. I'm wondering if you could unpack that a little bit. Are those unique providers? And if we thought about the geographic distribution, what percentage of them, for example, are UVM medical center, you know, are they hospital employed? That's a really good question. Think that through? That's a Who's good question. That? And they are, um, to answer your first question, they are unique providers. Okay. And typically they are not hospital because typically the hospitals have their own laboratories and the the benefit really are the offices the off-site offices okay so the large majority of these are independent providers not affiliated with hospitals well sometimes they are affiliated but they're not in the hospital if that makes sense okay. and okay yep thank you other questions for Tom um, one is just a, a, a reminder. I'm looking at the uh, line item education and outreach, which is phasing out um, as uh, part of your expense report. And I'm <clears throat> just uh, asking you to remind me who was being educated and outreach to. That was mostly, and correct me if I'm wrong, website development. And we brought that in house in terms of website development. Okay. Um, and going to the chart on uh, page 32, um, this uh, your your target for uh, consent is 42 percent for 2019. Um, do you have targets for 20 and 21, and or what assumptions have you made in this budget presentation having to do with uh, uh, any changes in the consent policy? What we have done in this budget is assume at the time, there's, I'm confident there's probably going to be a change in consent policy, but what, what is, um, well, I'm, not, I'm hopeful that there'll be change in consent policy. What we have done and assumed in this budget is a current consent policy. As it moves to an opt out, there's obviously in legislation right now a fairly consider, uh, considerable implementation phase in terms of how you do that. Um, that was not factored in this budget. We would probably, DIVA is taking the lead, but we obviously are in partners with DIVA on that. We'll have to sort of uh, flesh that out of how that works, but it's not in this budget right now. So there might be some going down the road if the consent policy has changed some upside opportunities uh, in terms of leveraging uh, past investments. Yes, and, and by the way, um, from a technological point of view, this is not a heavy lift for us. Um, from a from a implementation view uh, view and the ability to make sure that we we invite people and we listen to concerns as we're implementing and come up with an implementation policy that takes those concerns into uh, into place. That's going to take a little time. And one more, um, looking at the. Uh uh, the 40, uh, 42 percent calculation. What what is the denominator of that ratio? Um, I think it's five. Seven. In terms of uh, Vermont patients, what what is what is the number? I think it's five seventy. It's a five hundred and seventy four thousand and change. Are the number of patients that we have data on in the VHI? So that's. A so, little less than the total population in the state, obviously, 
but I see. that's the denominator we used because we so felt it was more accurate. So the numerator then is 174,000? Um, th that counts. And the no, denominator yeah. would be the, po the, the population of the state. Just, uh, there's five, we, we use 574 on the bottom. I think we use 200 and something on, on the top. Um, I'll get those numbers for you. We, you know, even if you use the Vermont population of 610, I mean, it's, it's minimal, the change in those, in those two numbers. And that counts opt-ins and opt-outs. So it's everyone who's been asked. So it's a little more than 200,000. Uh, I just have one question. Um, in terms of your fiscal year 20 budget assumptions, do you have any worries about any of these assumptions in terms of the likelihood that they'll bear fruit? Well, um, we're hoping uh, that all of them bear, <laughs> bear fruit. Um, we are, you know, we're under the assumptions. We made the budget on, on the assumption of what we put up on the screen here. Um, we're hoping all of them bear fruit. With any budget, you sort of adjust through through the year if something um, happens or changes. I think, um, you know, normally we come back about half year because of our, our revenue cycle and uh, and discuss any changes with the board. I expect perhaps we'll do that again uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Mike, as you're getting closer to the uh, date where uh, your service uh, um, commitment expires, what are the biggest fears that you have for a vitalized organization? You know, Mr. Chair, that's a great question. I had more fears last year than I do this year, uh, to be honest with you. I, I see, and I've said this in testimony in the legislature, um, vital is an important part of health care reform. I'm convinced of that in this state. Um, and I think the more that we can collaborate and bring vital um, to that point, I think it is, um, it is essential for a well-run health care um, sort of policy to have an established vital. And I wouldn't say that if I didn't believe it. Um, you know, I, I have no vested interest in, in this um, other than, you know, I get a salary and, and but I'll be leaving. The, the question, you know, that I have is, can we pull this all together? And, and make sure that we're all pulling in one direction. I think Vital showed that it can be done. You can reduce costs, you can reduce uh, revenue, and you can be successful in, in doing this. And uh, I think the thing that I think um, that w I'm working on now with this team is how do you bring in more revenue um, now that we've sort of stabilized operations and reestablished our credibility and now have the tools to really move forward, how do we bring in re um, uh, revenue? I'm confident we'll bring in revenue. It's just w will it meet the needs of uh, our future uh, direction? And I think it will. Any other questions? If not, we're going to open it up to public comment. Would someone like to uh, offer a comment or a question? Ken. Uh, I, I will say that uh, I was a little disappointed uh, in the presentation because having worked with Mike Smith and appreciating the team, I thought this report would have been produced probably within uh, a month or so after he took over. And it seems that it's taken a little longer, and I just assume that has something to do with age and slowing down a little. Um, I know that in some meetings uh, several years ago, I really thought Vital, frankly, was, uh, I used the word, sort of a disgrace of a project with very unclear direction, outcomes, leadership. So I just want to say it's appreciated to have a much more uh, robust presentation that uh, presents the potential of what vital could, could be in the healthcare reform method. Thank you. Other public comment or questions? Yes, Dale. Is it possible to elaborate more on, if I understood correctly, patient consent using electronic format? So how understandable will the format 
be and how will it be presented to the patient? This is on future, right? We're talking about if the opt-out is. We're working through those um, details now. The legislation calls for us to uh, come up with an implementation plan. It calls for the board to sort of approve the implementation plan to look at it. But we are looking at ways in order to get that information out uh, as we speak, uh, get that information out, and make it easier for the patient to to either opt in or opt out. It's it's a little the, the process right now is a little haphazard and trying to bring that in. But I, I guess to answer your question, that's to be determined as we move forward. Can I throw a copy? Certainly. The financials, I will pay for that because I noticed like you have education and so forth, the way you got it broke out. What would the clarification be on, is there a specific line item for that? in terms of the financials? I think that would probably be a more of a question for DIVA uh, than us, but th those are sort of discussions that we will have with DIVA as we move forward. I have not counted my was it, chickens before they hatch because we still have legislation that's going back and forth between the House and the Senate. Um, it passed the Senate yesterday. It's in the House with an amendment coming back to the Senate. Thank you, Dale, because those will be questions that the board will obviously be asking. Absolutely. Certainly will want to know what the um, reach out is to Vermonters and how Vermonters can be assured that they actually get a chance to weigh in one, one way or the other. Right. And we've heard from states like Maine where there's actually been direct mail pieces to residents there and things like that. So. Um, I guess we'll, we're all just going to have to stay tuned. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, we believe that the more outreach, the better um, on this because um, we want to make sure that patients make the right decision and also outreach to um, various uh, organizations to make sure that their input is heard on how we output, how we do the output. Okay, any outreach. other public comment or questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for your time. So at this time, we'll invite Jenny and uh, Emily down. Emily Richards, the Director of the Health Information Exchange Program at DIVA. And I'm Jenny Samuelson, the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Vermont Health Access. So here's the overview of what we're hoping to discuss today. Um, new DIVA staff introductions for Jenny. Um, a bit about the consent policy and how the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee had been thinking about consent policy implementation. Uh, we wanted to give you an update on the 2019 HIE Steering Committee. Uh, a very quick um, briefer on the Vital Diva contract and uh, general HIE program update. So, actually, Jenny, I don't have a slide for you. <laughs> So um, I know many of you, but I'm Jenny Samuelson. Um, I've recently taken the role of Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, prior to my work um, in, uh, in this role, I was working in the Commissioner's Office at DIVA, and then prior to that, since 2008, with the Blueprint for Health. Um, I've got a history of, of tracking the, health, the um, advancements of the health information exchange um, and other health care reform activities through my work at DIVA. Prior to um, working within the blueprint, I worked in public health, um, and that's where my, and long-term care, which is where my background originated. It. You didn't talk about your bowling skills. <laughs> <laughs> and I do enjoy bowling every once in a while. <laughs> You're good at it. <laughs> and 
I hope Jenny doesn't mind me saying, but I mean, to me, this seems like the perfect transition for the HIE program. Michael Costa, obviously, who we all hold near and dear, did an incredible job of building up individual units at DIVA, including the HIE unit. You know, we saw a lot of progression under his leadership, and now Jenny is working to unify of all of us under sort of the auspices of payment reform and care um, using HIE as a tool. So I just think that this is a really great evolution. So, all right. Now I've embarrassed you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like I said, we, we hope to talk about the health information exchange consent policy a bit. Um, as you all know, it's still in the legislature for discussion. Um, so this is a bit of a placeholder. Um, but, you know, Jenny and I have been at Senate Health and Welfare and at House Health Care uh, over the last few weeks, and we've had a lot of robust conversations with the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee about how a consent policy would uh, be appropriately implemented or um, we'd achieve shared goals. And what we've noticed through those conversations is that um, both sort of advocates and counter voices and those invested in it were kind of sharing three goals around implementation of the consent policy. First and foremost being that we all agreed that informed consent is really essential to this. Informed consent meaning that patients really understand how their data ex is exchanged, why, um, and what their rights are in terms of data exchange. The second being that however a policy is implemented, that it be a robust and transparent process, uh, both to stakeholders uh, and to the Green Mountain Care Board, the General Assembly. And finally, that um, there's a real stakeholder engagement process. So again, opposition voices and advocates alike have a place to say we, we want to represent a diversity of stakeholder needs or patient needs, um, and we want to make sure that we're achieving the goal of informed consent and we're really hearing those voices and building them in. So what we don't know uh, what is going to happen at the General Assembly with the consent um, policy, we did want to just sort of share those interactions with you um, and make sure that you knew how the HIE steering committee was thinking about supporting this process. Okay. Um, so back, back in our history in January when we were talking to you about consent and um, Stephen Odafe presented DIVA's um, recommendation uh, in the consent policy report. Um, we had gone to the HIE steering committee who was newly formed for 2019 and discussed how to implement. Um, and we really thought through kind of a five essential pieces of the implementation process. Um, again, multiple places for stakeholder feedback, multiple places for accountability, um, and really holding, a, partnering with stakeholders to help us identify the best ways to, to get patients involved and helping us to implement those practices. So we're starting here with DIVA proposes a draft consent policy, and that, um, I think as Stephen spoke about, was aimed at not changing the current consent policy um, in a, a not changing it too much, um, but really emphasizing what the roles of the health information exchange operator are, providers, and the rights of patients. Then um, asking DIVA to facilitate stakeholder work groups to determine how to best implement policy. Um, and this, those stakeholder work groups are intended to result in a recommendation. So we'd pull together groups like the healthcare advocate, ACLU, disabilities advocates, and others, um, and really get them thinking about uh, the diversity of ways that people hear and um, can absorb information and really be planful about um, informed consent implementation. Then the steering committee planned to take that recommendation um, and sort of map out how to successfully implement it. Um, some of these things have a technical component, some of these things have a development timeline. So thinking about like how can we feasibly roll out all of the recommendations that the stakeholders have come up with. Um, we would come back to the Green Mountain Care Board um, to review the consent policy and the implementation strategy. At that time, we thought it would be best as part of the HIE plan because we were coming to you anyway with that. Um, and then sort of get to work um, in implementing hopefully what um, you all approved. Simultaneously, um, the idea was that DIVA in consultation with HIE steering committee uh, would be um, providing regular updates on how planning and implementation were going. So I think those sort of concepts are reflected in what the General Assembly is discussing now and if that doesn't result in what we think it will result in, we still feel Diva and the steering committee still feel that these are sort of the tenets to successfully implementing a change in policy. 
Um, so, guiding principles for implementation. I think it's important to understand sort of the essence of what the steering committee talked about when they um, talked about achieving those three goals, particularly in informing consent in a real way. So when they thought about what would guide the implementation process, they thought about these principles. First, to build on the consent policy, policy management successes of other states and systems. You know, today in Vermont, there are some healthcare systems that are healthcare organizations that are doing this in a way that I think patients would feel like is successful. Um, so not not uh, duplicating what they're doing, but rather building on what they're doing. And we have a lot of examples of states that have the opposite policy of us or a dynamic consent policy, as we might consider it, and to learning from how they've implemented those processes. Prioritizing patient education and access to information for all of the reasons that I just covered. Working to reduce or limit burden associated with consent management and envelop changes to processes into broader consent management practices. And we heard this from legislators, we heard this from the steering committee. I mean, privacy disclosure is already required under HIPAA, and we are already asking our healthcare organizations to talk to patients about consent. So we don't want to add an additional process. We want to consider really thoughtfully what exists today, what are their current obligations, and build the process into uh, what exists in the provider community. Um, respecting existing state and federal laws regarding sharing of specific types of health data, and this is a nod towards there are some clinically sensitive data types that will not be covered by this policy, so making sure that patients really understand what is and is not exchangeable and how. Um, honoring consent preferences that have already been expressed by Vermont patients. This was really big to the steering committee because we don't want to go back out and ask people. We want to make sure that if somebody has expressed a consent preference already, or 40% of Vermonters have, that they don't need to be re-asked, but the opportunity to change their preference is available. And finally, assessing feasibility of different consent management practices and planning implementation strategies accordingly. Steering committee talked a lot about a self-service module, meaning not a provider-driven consent uh, process whereby you have to see a clinician and they have to record your consent preference, working towards a way whereas us as patients, whether we're seeking care or not, can manage our own consent preference. But that's not going to happen overnight, so creating a feasible plan together. All right, so I'm going to switch gears and talk about the steering committee. And it's hopefully my one and only typo in front of the Green Mountain Care Board, but that first name should be Jenny Samuelson. <laughs> so uh, the 2019 steering committee kicked off um, in February or so. And just to sort of set the stage as a reminder, coming off of the 2017 evaluation, which Health Tech executed, they pointed out a lot of um, things that Vermont could be doing better. And one of them was governance. So we pretty immediately set up a steering committee, um, first and foremost to help us develop a statewide strategic plan. Um, that committee was great. They hit the ground running. They developed the plan, presented it to you, which was approved in November. So now they are building on that plan, which was really foundational, and they've jumped into a few goals this year. So you see that we've, st we've kept the uh, group relatively small, and in the HIE plan we detail why uh, this group is asked uh, to do a lot of work, and there are many existing groups of stakeholders that can hopefully represent specific stakeholder interests, and they have committed to reaching out to those stakeholders to involve them in the process and planning, but not burdening them by asking them to be on this group. So the folks in green are new, um, but hopefully those everybody here looks relatively familiar to you. Okay. So just to talk a little bit about their goals, and these are um, detailed in the HIE plan from that you all approved the, the existing plan. Uh, we've, we had a tactical plan, if you remember. So the HIE plan uh, discusses you know, um, health information exchange broadly, challenges, uh, essential pieces, key players, and then we've got an annualized plan that says, okay, so what are we doing this year to address those uh, issues that we've identified? And so for the steering committee, this is what they've uh, committed to. Uh, so first, to assess potential changes in the state's consent policy, which we just discussed. Um, next, to conduct an assessment of the state's data governance efforts and the, excuse me, and define the steering committee's role in relation to existing work. 
um, just for like the non a non technical explanation of data governance is just sort of policies and standards and operational practices that would allow you to exchange actual data elements. Um, and so the steering committee is at a really strategic level, planning level, but we know that data governance is needed to successfully exchange clinical data across the healthcare system. So trying to figure out where those two concepts kind of marry and how the steering committee can help support policies and standards, et cetera, that will um, further the achievement of the goals that they've outlined in the HIE plan. So that's underway. Um, they've also committed to evaluating health information exchange proposals, current work, and the HIE plan implementation. So year over year, they'll just be looking at what they committed to and, and how it's been going. This year, I, we kicked off with a much more in-depth look at what each organization rep represented on the steering committee is doing to further HIE goals, where their challenges are, where their opportunities. And it's been a really incredible opportunity to start a conversation about what we want to achieve in years to come, where there's duplication, where there are opportunities. It's, it's been great. Um, we actually, I think, we wrapped up the last one today, and the Green Mountain Care Board presented at our last meeting, which was great on VCARES. Uh, the next one here, it draft a technical roadmap that reflects a three to five year investment and growth strategy related to key HIE strategic objectives. And I'll spend a little bit more time on this because this is their big, big deliverable for the year. And then finally, once they've done that, they're going to look at financing and sustainability for the year to come. Um, last year, they reflected on sort of key considerations and challenges as it related to financing and sustainability and thought and reflected on the need to shift the public-private investment ratio in HIE. And so this year, we hope to add some granularity to that, um, uh, hopefully a few tactics related to execution of the technical roadmap as well. And no, no later than November 1st, um, we'll be back, not me, but <laughs> someone will be back um, to update the HIE plan or to provide you with an updated HIE plan that will include all of those things that we just discussed. And I think one of the key points here, um, both through the, the presentation you saw from Vital earlier and through the progress of the steering committee, is that we committed in the last HIE plan to, to continue to make the progress that you've seen in over the, the previous year. And I believe that both this and the vital presentation really begin to demonstrate that we have um, made progress in achieving some of those goals towards that tactical plan. Great. So just a bit on the technical roadmap. Um, so this year's HIE plan, we're envisioning it as an update rather than a full scale, scale overhaul. So in the current HIE plan, what you see in the technical section is a discussion of the technical components of HIE, an IT modular architecture that separates those components into foundational and or exchange services and end user services, talks about roles and challenges for achieving each technical component. So we're gonna build on that section this year, um, an action plan that will look at the next three to five years and what we need to think about in terms of data exchange, technology, um, and all of sort of the component parts that surround those um, in order to further the HIE goals which are stated in the plan itself. So to help us with this, um, we've hired a, a collaborative of national experts, Lantana Consulting and Velatora. And their approach is to develop an actionable, actionable roadmap that's kind of helping us balance immediate needs, how do we solve for the immediate problems, and consider what's coming up in the future. And we'll talk a little bit about how federal government and others are driving innovation very quickly. Um, they also want to make sure that we're thinking about safeguarding the investments that we've made, not locking ourselves into vendor relationships, really creating some agility, um, and advancing what we've built to date rather than creating new things where um, services are already serving the need. So Lantana is a Vermont-based company, a woman-owned company. You may have uh, met the president and CEO, Leora Elschuler. She helped us with some of the technical components of last year's health information exchange plan. And she's been in this world for 10, 15 years, first helping Center for Medicaid or Medicare and Medicaid Services establish standards for meaningful use or that the electronic health record incentive program. 
um, and she's evolved her business in many ways. Uh, she's asked to be a national leader on setting national data exchange standards through HL7, um, and we're really, I just think, lucky to have her. We had great success working with her last year. And she's brought in Velatora. Velatora is important to us because, as you may remember, Michael and I came back last year and we said, we based all of this health information exchange planning on use cases, or what it means to individual stakeholders, right? But Velatora is really like where that use case concept was kind of birthed as it relates to health information exchange. They have something called the Michigan Health Information Network, which is kind of uh, this ancillary governance body that's coming up with policies and standards that influence the HIE operator, but not or, or not the HIE operator themselves. And they're an offshoot of the learnings at the Michigan Health Information Network. So we're gonna build on their ideas of what they call the use case factory. Um, they test interoperability possibilities in a technological framework, um, and they just have had a lot of success when it comes to bringing different groups together. So I think those two groups together will really, will benefit the state of Vermont. And we're kind of running with this model of, you know, we're a small state, we don't have a ton of national experts, so bringing, be, using the steering committee to think really thoughtfully about what our strategy is for the year to come, and then bringing in expertise to help us achieve our goals on an annual basis. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna shift gears to the Diva Vital contract, but I wanna make this one quick because Vital did such a great job of talking about all of their component parts. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to leave you with here. Um, first, like we are, we're noticing that Vital is meeting or superseding all of their goals for this year, which is great. And all of those goals are in alignment with the Health Information Exchange Plan, which this governance body, the steering committee set forth. So that alignment is really incredible, I think. And so this thing that you're seeing on the top right of the screen, that's the IT modular architecture. Sorry, that's a, such a boring phrase. <laughs> but that's the thing that we put in the HIE plan to sort of guide how we're thinking about who invests in what in health information exchange and the fact that you need to build the foundation of the house before you're building the roof. And so we've separated uh, the component parts of Vital's contract to align with that IT modular infrastructure, and they've set goal. We've all set goals um, towards furthering each of those component parts, which I think is great. And I love the question about what are their goals for next year. Um, and we are actually, if you can believe it, already thinking about their contract for next year. The way the federal funding process works is we need to go to the feds in July and say this is what we're thinking for six months for now from now, can you help us um, by providing some federal participation? Um, and so we've been partnering with Vital uh, to both build on this work and to take adv advantage of some more expansive opportunities. Um, they're thinking a lot about what has been successful in other states, for example, connections with uh, the HIE and EMS services. A lot of uh, California, for instance, has had great success in rolling that out, so how can we take advantage and build on um, what they've done? And CMS really likes that project, so that's an area where we can get federal support uh, to sort of build an avenue of exchange. So um, over the next few months, we'll be setting those goals and going out for the federal funding request. The final contract will be drafted in the November timeframe, just because we have to send it back to CMS to review, um, and our plan is to execute on January 1st. All right, this is brief. Missing going back, no? Okay. So shifting gears once more, an HIE program update. I think for the last couple of times we've been here, I just wanted to make sure that um, sort of some things that are happening at the national level are on your radar and kind of the big picture things that are impacting the program are um, just, you know, in your realm of thinking as you consider what the steering committee is doing and our relationship with VITAL. So first, and I, I, this is duplicative, I've, I've mentioned this before, but I think it's important. Um, Vermont and other states across the nation have taken advantage of federal funding under the High Tech Act, first to digitize health records. So this is where the boom in electronic health records happened through meaningful use under Medicare and Medicaid. We still operate the Medicaid meaningful use program and will through 2021. It's actually a very successful per capita program here in Vermont. I think we're ranked number three. So a lot of providers have taken advantage of it. 
So CMS first thought, great, we need to digitize health records. And then they thought, there's a funding opportunity here. Let's drive towards interoperability or actually making these systems talk to one another and data exchangeable across the healthcare system. So they've continually expanded funding opportunities under that act over the last few years. It's important to note that this funding opportunity expires in late 2021. We've really maximized a lot of great opportunities through the High Tech Act. And what CMS has said is we've noticed that nationwide. So we're going to hopefully make this, this opportunity continually available under the Medicaid Management Information System. And that's just the sort of how the technology we use to operate Medicaid. Um, and folks do nationwide. So we're in a transitional period. We're still learning a lot about exactly what those mean, that means, um, but that could have a potential impact on the types of projects we can fund, um, particularly as they um, go further and further away from actually Medicaid direct care. Next up here is that the Office of the National Coordinator and CMS have proposed a couple of rules. Um, they're complicated and there is a lot to them, so I'm just really oversimplifying this here. Um, but generally speaking, they're aimed at driving interoperability and simplifying patient access to records. Um, so they're using a lot of carrots and sticks to make that happen. Um, it's still in rulemaking, so they, I think the, um, the public comment period is open for another month or so, but this will very likely have a pretty big impact on how folks develop technology in the HIE sphere, um, and then how payers and patients can interact with data. As part of this, and we've talked about this before, the 21st Century Cures Act, which came out a couple of years ago, um, imposed upon the Office of the National Coordinator to set up something called the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. So they're now just creating rules around how they would implement this. And this like very simple graphic on the right-hand side kind of explains what they're trying to achieve. So they're saying we need one national hub, HIE hub, We'll have qualified health information networks underneath that. So that could be regional hubs, that could be local hubs, depending on whoever qualifies. And then we'll have participants who could be EHRs, they could be local HIEs, they could be payers, all feeding up into those qualified health information that qual those qualified health information networks. So the idea is to support achievement of national interoperability. So us as patients, we can see a provider here in Vermont, we can go to Wisconsin, we can go to California, and our data is going to follow us. Because most of the rules that the feds have pushed so far have been really state-driven and have, have um, resulted in state-derived approaches. And so what they're trying to do is create this national landscape. So, a lot to be seen there. Um, you know, a lot could happen. Someone, one of our national experts, to say, said today, five years in health information exchange is like a lifetime. So, <laughs> it, you know, we could come back a year from now and the landscape could be very different. So I wanted to have that on your radar. And then partnerships are expanding. Do you want to touch on that point as I've been talking a lot? Yeah. So um, in Vermont, one of the things that we that we began to look at is, is that the, the landscape um, that we had here there were, there were multiple times that we were being asked to invest in the same sort of technology. Um, and specifically, we asked a few of our partners, um, the Blueprint, uh, Vital, and uh, the ACO, to look at whether there was an approach where we could begin to partner across those programs to make the investments one time. So coming out of that work, Vermont is now um, the, that group of partners identified Maine as, a, as an opportunity for us to create a shared services model because a Maine has established and set up technology around um, their translation services, um, around the connectivity and interfaces. Um, and so we are, we are planning on part, the, that group of partners is planning on partnering um, with the state of Maine to create a shared services model. Under that shared services model, um, we're uh, kind of ex we're exploring um, the opportunity for us to shift some of the elements further up um, into uh, providing the, the data matching and the data management earlier, um, which may allow us to um, begin a conversation about what types of data um, we can exchange. We have also started the conversation across the New England states and exploring strategies across the states for maximizing data collection through the prescription monitoring program and systems um, and the sensible co connect collection of that data um, into the HIEs um, and the health record systems. 
Can you just add to that? I, I think that's great. And, you know, CMS for the last couple of years has really been pushing states to reuse investments um, and to think about regional approaches. So this is really in alignment with where nationally folks hope that we go. And it allows us to take advantage of a lot of the great work that's happened region wide. You know, I think Maine's excited to work with Vermont because Vital has done things that they haven't. And we're really excited to take advantage of um, their HIE, particularly as they have an entirely different financing and sustainability model than we do here. So it's an interesting way to think about how we collaborate. So that is it. We had 30 minutes. Hopefully we didn't go over. Are there any questions? You did great. Questions? That's how thorough you were. <laughs> Sorry, <Mike. laughs> Can I make an announcement that I well, failed to make earlier? Okay. I just, it's about public comment for the vital. Okay. Go ahead. So I just want to make sure okay. uh, folks know that um, open or public comment is a, um, starting today on the vital budget. It is posted on our website under public comment and under what's new. And again, it's opening today. It will run until Monday, June 3rd at 12 p.m. And the materials are linked to that uh, public comment. Period. Thank you. Any public comments on the uh, presentation? Any comments or questions? Dale? So I'm looking at the HIE steering committee and I can't help but notice, I'm trying to be careful how I word this because there's definitely two sides to this theme. I'm looking at the expertise that is addressing this issue. Now, it is an issue that needs a lot of expertise to design a system that's gonna work. I can't go to the regular consumer to get that. I need something like a think tank. It's really complicated what some of these issues are, even in terms of consent. At the same time, look at who is giving the input, and it's experts. And this is one of the things that bothers me a lot, is it's not the carpenter that lives on Jane Street. It, it's not the average person that is actually going to be asked for to give consent. And I don't know how you work that disparity. I even experience it when I walk in. I have been around healthcare so much. I can get a better interaction in a doctor's office than I know some people can because I know the system. They might say, you asked a good question. And I'm thinking to myself, that was because I know the system. If I didn't do what I do, I probably couldn't have asked that question. So I'm just, I just, as a consumer, think we need to be really careful with this going forward. We need everything they've done, and you did excellent work. I'm not criticizing. You've done excellent work. But I am testing the waters of it. And that's what I think we need to do. Somewhere down the road here, there is going to still be that test of those that are being opted in or opt out will probably end up opt out, but there's going to have to be an understanding of the person that has been affected, which brings up the curiosity question of under opt out, well, the only time that they look to consider the importance of their consent is when they have a problem. 
at which point it's a complaint to opt out. Those are some of the things you get into that I just can't help but wonder about. And maybe it sounds like I'm overthinking it, but I'm not sure that I am. Is Linda Liu meant to be the consumer member? She is, yes. And I don't know her at all, but would you call her the average consumer or? She's a very knowledgeable consumer. She did work at Blue Cross and she is an RN. So she has a great background. You know, the HIV steering committee is a big commitment. Um, and so it was not easy to find a consumer um, rep. A healthcare advocate tried to help me for a while. Um, it, it, we were lucky to have Linda because she is really knowledgeable and able to jump into this area that's often very technical. But I think to Dale's really good question about how do you involve the consumer voice in the consent policy implementation. That's why the steering committee really wants to rely on that stakeholder engagement series. So we are thinking about the diversity of consumer needs and how people internalize information. Um, this is not the easiest subject. I mean, you know, just even using the term opt in, opt out can be really confusing to people. Um, so thinking about how we're using language and mechanisms and placement in a way that's gonna be most meaningful to people. I think one of the other things that we, we talked about with the legislature, um, recognizing that folks receive information in different in different ways um, and from di and from different people, in a variety of abilities to ingest that. We really, in this process, not only want to engage stakeholders in the process of informing how we're going to implement um, if there is a change of a consent policy but also assist us in um, providing the information and beginning to look at where we do consent as not potentially only in a provider's office um, where you're talking about a traditional healthcare provider, but can we begin to look at um, our designated agencies um, and other um, places where people can um, receive the information in a way that may be more culturally appropriate um, for them. Um, and, and also to potentially receive it in multiple different locations. I think we have a lot of conversations about duplication. I think that the opt-in, opt-out conversation is a potentially complicated um, question for many individuals and their circumstances change. So we wanna give the opportunity for them to hear the information uh, more than once. Okay. Other public comments or questions? Eric? So my name is Eric Schultes, I'm with the Healthcare Advocate. Um, I'm heartened, cautiously heartened, that the, I'm heartened that the discussion has moved away from the high operational goals and a 42% to thinking about uh, the meaningful consent of patients. I, I have continued, I don't think the debate is truly about opt-in and opt-out. I think if you look at most of the literature on this, um, that is a general opinion, and the real issue is how can we do this in a way that Vermonters understand what they're doing? We're not, the goal is not just to increase participation at the expense of consumers. I think the devil is gonna be in the details in this stakeholder engagement. Um, I think there's room for substantial improvement in how this plays out. I think these are concerns about engagement that legislators have expressed. Um, I would also like to build off of what Dale is saying, that there is no universal single person who represents consumers. Um, and I think the board has done a, in a different arena, has done a wonderful job of realizing that you have to go to where people are. And I think in the stakeholder, it's not going to be, in the stakeholder engagement process, it's not going to be enough to have one representative. But that I hope that DIVA will make the investment to go out and meet Vermonters where they are so that they can hear their uh, input. And um, you know that might be leveraging community partnerships. I know, at least in the poverty world, uh, VLA has, uh, Vermont Legal Aid has a substantial amount of community uh, relationships with organizations. And I think we would uh, be more than happy to work with DIVA to set up uh, focus groups or town halls in the communities where Vermonters live. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. 
other questions or comments from the public? Susan. Um, I was heartened to see um, the group of people that will be consulted was widened to include more than just the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Well, I think they do a tremendous job. Um, they're just one body in the ACLU, and I think I even saw disability advocates in the list, so that was a nice thing. Um, I think one of the takeaway lessons from the SIM grant was that true stakeholder engagement um, takes a lot of time. It's necessary to build the buy-in for anything to succeed, but it takes time and maybe more significantly, um, it takes money and resources and people who know how to make things accessible. So while I'm really encouraged to see the words appearing, I hope people do it well, and that's going to take money, and it's going to take people who know how to talk to people with disabilities and know how to have an accessible meeting. And giving people 50-page handouts, this is what's happening right now in the world of developmental disability payment reform. Handouts are given the day of the meeting, even a couple days before the meeting, but they're not accessible. So it'll be great if the people are in the room, but please make it a, a process that, that people can actually engage in. People with low literacy, low health literacy, different ways of communicating, different languages. We're all healthcare consumers. We're all going to have our information sucked into the great big beehive. We should all be able to understand what's going on. Thank you, Susan. Other public comments or questions? Seeing none, I wish to thank you both. Thank you, thank you for your time today. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.